Hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting me over here. Um, it's actually pretty much the first time that I do a conference with, uh, with a big screen like this, so I've never done this before. So um, I'm going to introduce, wait, let me see how I do this. OK, I'm going to introduce, I'm a sculptor designer. I create uh, objects for big brands like Chanel, Dior, this kind of brands, making perfumes and things like that. And uh, some years ago, two years ago, I, um, I bought a 3D printer because for my job, for what I do, I wanted to, to improve what I'm doing. And this was a good concept because I could then start to work on the computer and export the things into real life, making objects. So when I decided to get a 3D printer, my wife said, uh, "It's what are you going to do with that kind of thing? You're going to print only little rabbits. And I thought, <laughs> it's maybe possible to do other things than just little rabbits. Maybe if we assemble the things together, more like Legos, we should be able to construct uh, bigger things. So how did it go? Why? Did I choose an uh, um, open source uh, 3D printer because I use Linux, because I use Blender, which is also open source software. And this is how um, I think we should move forward into the society. Sharing things is pretty much important to me. So when I got uh, the request for to make a quote or to create a hand, a prosthetic hand, for a big French brand, I thought, OK, I'm going to use my 3D printer. I just have it. I want to play with that thing. So um, I designed, uh, I started to, to think of how I was going to assemble the part and design the thing. And the quote, the job didn't work, actually. So it just ended up like this. But since I had my 3D printer, I thought, all right, I'm going to do it for myself. So I designed the hand, put the parts together, printed it. And then once it was, um, let me go to the next one. Yes, like this. Once it was designed, I could assemble the parts together. And uh, it was not controlled. It was just with cables. You could move it around. I decided to share it with other people because my 3D printer was coming from the open source world. And all the things you could see on Thingiverse you could download them and print them as well. So I posted the things on Thingiverse. I don't know if you know this site. It's a site where you can download objects, print them on your printer, and reproduce what other people has, have uh, designed. Um, at that point, what happened is uh, there's a lot of people that started to ask me, oh, wow, this hand, you know, it's really nice. Can we use it for real prosthetic? And I was thinking, no, this, this is only a plastic thing. You can move it with cables, but it's, that's it. You know, it cannot go any further. It, it's better to, to buy a real prosthetic you know, in, the, in the shops. And um, I'm a little bit stressed. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so um, people were asking this kind of things. And I thought, all right, what? can I do with this? You know, I'm going to start to learn, find out how to put motors into the hand and how to control this. I had never done robotics before. So I searched for an easy solution to control little motors. I thought, if I use plain, RC plane motors, maybe I can do that. So I found out servos could be controlled by Arduino. Arduino board is a very uh, compact little controller, which is open source. And you can uh, put code into the, into the board. And once you have the code, it can control the motor. So working with that, and that's uh, all of this is coming actually from the internet. You got so much information. You can grab things, learn things. And that's how I discovered all of this. Um, once I had my Arduino, I could control the motors. And I thought, all right. This is working. I can control it with the keyboard. I can make the finger move open and close. And there was a lot of people that wanted to, to do the same thing. So I thought what I'm going to design is a little simple thing, which is a finger starter. You have the Arduino board, a servo motor, 
with one finger, the same one that you have on, on the hand. So like this, you can easily, for schools, for anybody, you can download this, print it, put the Arduino, the servo motor, and actuate the finger. You just drop the code into the Arduino, and that's it. You can do it. So once uh, I was at this point, I thought, OK, I've got a hand. I've got a forearm that can be controlled with my keyboard. What am I going to do now? So I'm going to work further. I'm going to make the bicep. So I work on this part, designing the whole bicep. I went through a different iteration. This is the last one. And um, the servos that I was using, they were a little bit uh, small and cheap, so uh, like 12 euros for a servo. And the, the, the most expensive one, the strongest one that I found, were 23 kilo torques. So um, those servo servos, they couldn't carry so much. So I had to think of another way of how to uh, actuate the thing, using those small servos into another situation. So I thought, OK, what about a power drill? You've got a power drill. Once you start to drill into a piece of wood, it's so strong, that little tiny drill. I thought, OK, I'm going to print a drill and put it on the servo motor. That's how I came up with the, the uh, the system in the bicep. So you can see on the top, on the right, there's the servo motor, and then the actuator that actually drills into a, it's like, a, yeah, like a screw that, that pulls into a part. So further, I designed the shoulder, working still on the same principle, but the shape there, you can see that the shoulders are large, the bicep is too small, and it was not in the correct, uh, correct size for a human. So I redesigned everything and uh, went further into the designing to get really something that would be more human, <clears throat> because I'm a sculptor, more than a robot roboticist. So it was important to me to have something that really looked uh, more like sculptural. At that point, I could, that's the nice thing also with the internet and with the computer is you print a part, you have it in your computer, and you can just mirror it into the computer and get the other arm. So I could print two hands, two forearms, two biceps together, and two shoulders. And I thought, okay, this is great. I, I almost have the top of the, the, the body. But now, what do I do? I have two Arduinos controlling two arms, and they cannot be uh, synchronized. So I went on the internet again, you know, thanks to the internet. And um, I searched for a software that could allow me to control the two, to synchronize those two boards together. This took me a while. There was no software. I mean, there is many software for robotics, but it's just uh, so complex, you know, it's so advanced that it, it wouldn't fit, fit my needs. That's perfect. And um, so I looked for many, uh, many things, you know, there was things online, there was all kinds of stuff. And finally, I discovered a, a software that is called My Robot Lab. And this thing, it's a guy, just one guy that runs the software. And uh, he puts things together, bricks, open source bricks, and he puts them together for, um, for to be able to control anything, a little DC motor, a servo motor, anything you want. You have a vacuum cleaner room by, you can control it with that software. So I thought maybe I could use this. And um, I got in contact with him through, uh, through email, and I told him my story. He already had seen the parts of the hands on the, on the internet. And uh, I told him, I want to synchronize those, thing, those two arms together. Is that possible? He said, yeah, no problem. We're just going to work on it. It's software. Everything is possible. And I thought, wow, this is the best answer I can hear. So I, I kept on working with this guy. And uh, with, um, with the help of him and other people, I could uh, design, not design, actually, control the, the eyes of the robot. So, Working on the head, I could have the eyes that were moving f uh, faster than the head. I don't know if you see. So that, that means it controls more like you have an eye movement before having the head movement. Those things 
you know, for me, it was just impossible to do. But the community coming around and helping programming this kind of thing was becoming possible. So I designed the head, making all the mechanism inside, making the mechanism for the jaw as well, with no programming, just thinking, okay, I'm sure somebody is gonna come up with a, a little code that is gonna help once he's gonna talk, he's gonna start to move the mouth. And I went on, drawing, putting things together. Every time a part was ready, I would release it on the internet, so like this, everybody else could download the parts, reproduce it, and um, share their ideas, how we can uh, actually um, go on further on this project. I think it's very important to, um, to, to, to share um, the, uh, the concept of things, because all of this, what I'm getting here, is mainly because internet exists, because there's people that have been posting tutorials on the internet how to put an Arduino together, a servo motor, and this is really a concept that is way beyond, way further into the future. So, no, I'm going back. All right. Um, from then, I had the head, and uh, I redesigned the, the whole torso, because, uh, like I said, the torso had to be changed into shapes, becoming more like human. So I'm, I, I uh, reduced the size of the shoulders, redu reduced the size of the torso in length, and made it more realistic. Um, some people said, if we have a Kinect included into the robot, we should be able to see in three dimensions. So I thought, okay, what is a Kinect actually? Uh, so, <laughs> so I went to look on the internet again, you know, and thinking, okay, a Kinect is a thing we can see three dimensional, you can play games, but how am I going to connect this into my, into my uh, Arduino? How am I going to control this? And the guys by my robot lab, they said, no, we're gonna work on it. It's only a question of code, that's it. We just put the Kinect in there. So I designed it. The Kinect, you can see it's the black line on the bottom. And um, it stayed like this with the Kinect, doing nothing for almost uh, five months. You know, until, I, I will tell you later, until somebody came up with the idea how to make it, uh, make it work. In the meantime, uh, like I said, many people were asking me, can we use this hand as a prost prosthetic purpose? And that's how I met Hugues and Nicolas Huchet. And they, um, they asked me, they said, we want to use the in-move hand for to really control it with, with sensors, muscle sensors. So we talked together, we met, and, um, and from that point I decided to really redesign something on the hand that would be totally usable as a prosthetic. So here, this new hand, as inside the motors, there's, so there's four motors, five motors, sorry, there's an Arduino board inside. There's also um, the three drivers that can control the hand. And there's an advanced, advanced technology uh, muscle sensor. It's all in there. Took me a year to do this. So um, this is just about ready, the new hand. All right, I'm gonna drink something. Um, there were so many people communicating with emails all the time, and I had to reorganize all of this together. I had never done a website either, so I thought, okay, how can I do this? You know, there's a, I'm gonna set up a, a blog on the internet, and there's people that propose to make a website. So there's an Italian that uh, made the website for, for us. So I could reorganize all the files, put the tutorials, create really everything into a line, so like this, everybody can follow the project and learn from it. So that was a tremendous work because um, uh, uh, fighting in, against spams is, uh, is is incredible. You know, my website my website is attacked by spams all the time, and that takes me a lot of time. Anyway, um, I reorganized everything together, the files, and uh, updating the parts as well. 
as long and posting them on the internet, like uh, making the tutorials. So like this, you could see really all the parts together with their names and be able to assemble it just like, just like a Lego. That's the purpose of it. And that's, I think, one of the key. I mean, you can release something open source, but if nobody can actually reproduce what you're doing, there's no use. So making it very simple, very basic for, for the people is the key. Even a kid can look at this, take the name, and put the things together, and start to glue them together, and he's got a bicep or torso. At the same time, I'm redesigning, re going further. You see the Kinect is still there, still didn't work. And um, <laughs> I designed the rest of the stomach with actuations so like this, the torso could move sideways and also rotate on itself. OK, that's what I got now. This is um, the robot at this level. That's what I got. Um, what, it, what, what happens now? The people, they are downloading the files, and uh, they are reproducing this robot, and they are reproducing the hand for many, many projects. And many of them, I really am not aware of, about them. There's, um, we have uh, found out, we have created a, a map where the people can say where they are and what they are building. So there's at the moment more than 42 countries building a hand or a robot. And those 42 countries, there's at least 20 universities building the robot or just a hand for any purpose. They can use it with a sensor on the head, with the sensors on the fingers, on, on the muscles, sorry. They, um, there's many, many projects. So I'm going to show you some of these projects. Some of them I'm going to comment, and some not. This is Bionico project with Hugues and Nicolas Huchet, where they can control the hand with muscle sensors. These are other hands printed, like on the left, on the top, you, they are using bending sensors for to communicate. Another hand. Nicolas Huchet again with the, with the hand. These are other projects using the hand. Actually, they, they just print them and, and start to work on it. I don't know what they are doing. Some of them are doing incredible stuff. So one of uh, the next project is to reduce the hole in move to make an in move junior, because we found out that uh, the size of the robot is human size. Actually, it's the same size than me. And um, uh, making it smaller would be easier for people to start the project. So we have started to, some people have started to re take the, the design, reduce the hands into a small size, so it's going to be about one meter twenty high, using still small servos, very cheap, very low price. This is a head. I don't know who's doing that. <laughs> this is in uh, Russia. They use the, the robot in a university for to start uh, communication between human and the robot. This is in England. It's in. Uh, college and they are using this with the kids it's actually they have built the the, the robot on the beach during uh, one day for an, an afternoon they had all the parts and together they built the robot these are various uh, iteration colors so on the left side is the robot he doesn't have the kinect on this picture but that's the guy that gave the first code to actually um, control the robot through the Kinect. On the right side, it's a, a Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, 3D printed robot. And this one, he also added some, some codes into the thing for to control the, what you, there's a ring over here that allows you to communicate with the robot. It's nil pixel ring, so it gives colors for to give the mood of the robot. This is also in Holland. I liked it because it's a black robot, and we need black robots. Because uh, this, is, this one is uh, in Russia also. And this guy is working in um, um, aer aerospace, and he came along. Every time 
that I get invited into a country, they ask, I ask the people that are building a robot to bring their robots. So like this, I can see how they are doing it and what are the things that they need. If we need a, a, a new board, a new connecting system for, to improve the system. And that's very interesting. I think, uh, it, once again, it's about sharing information and having people giving their, their ideas. That's also in Russia. That's in Italy. I like the colors, it's like a superhero. This is a university in Georgia. This is a university in Poland. This is, uh, they are working with muscle sensors on the hand for to be able to see if that person that lost the hand is able to actuate his, uh, his muscles, the, the, the one that, where the limb is missing. Um, on the left corner, you can see the InMove is trying to fly the plane. I wouldn't like to be in the plane. Um, <laughs> on the right side, it's Hugues with Nicolas Huchet working on the prosthetic project, Bionico. On the bottom side left, it's, uh, they are teaching the hand how to play rock, paper, scissors. You know, rock, paper, scissors. Uh, face recognition with the camera. So it was interesting to see this. It's just somebody that posted a, a tweet saying, hey, um, my uh, camera can recognize InMove as a real face. So I thought it was interesting. And of course, InMove has to travel. So sometimes it gets into the car. And uh, <laughs> I think he enjoys the rides. <laughs> so, Next step, it was, uh, okay, I've got the whole talk now, and um, from my point of view at the beginning, I thought the most simplest thing is to print a segue, like you just print the wheels, you print the parts together and put motors on it, and you're gonna be able to roll the whole robot. And um, uh, that was uh, the, the, the easiest way, especially because uh, some wheeled robot is totally possible today. But of course, there's a community behind, and they say, well, no, we don't want wheels, we want legs. So I thought, okay, we're gonna make legs, I'm gonna design legs, I'm gonna try to work on the mechanism. Uh, can I use still servo motors for this kind of things? And uh, actually, it's not possible. At, the, at this state, it's not possible. So I'm working on the new actuator, a new system that is going to be um, as cheap as a servo motor, and as fast, I mean faster than a solar motor because we need to be able to work on the balance. So I'm trying to find parts on um, where you can supply everywhere, a little motor, some rope or something. And it's what I'm working on at the moment. It's uh, quite a challenge. And what I'm focusing is trying to make the robot fast enough for the legs, strong enough for to support the top, and not focusing on the robot to walk. I just think, once I have this, we, the other one, they're gonna make him walk. You know, they're gonna work on the codes for to make him walk. If we need the big planks under the feet for it to keep the balance, okay, we'll do that. But at the moment, I'm just working on my stuff, just like I did for the rest of things. I get the information, what the people want, and I implement that into my, uh, into my robot. Of course, uh, there's the option to use wheels, so there's, uh, I didn't do it, but there's other one that already used the robot hand. I've put them on the wheels. So this one can drive around and do things. He can actually be controlled with a, a joystick. And uh, he has the Kinect on the front and is uh, able to be controlled with Oculus Rift. So that means you do things like this. This is the Oculus Rift. I don't know if you know what it is. It's like a mask with a cam with a picture inside, with a uh, like more like a film inside. And through the film, you can see what the robot is seeing through the eyes. So when you move your head and look around, the robot is moving the head around and looking for you. And that means you can also control the arm with um, with some sensors, so the robot is moving. So the idea is using it for telepresence. Um, maybe in uh, projects like hospitals, there's many things uh, coming up, like kids could be in the hospital, 
the robot is driving around into a, um, a museum or something like this, and he's controlling it and seeing the things. So there's already projects like this coming up with the, with the InMove on the top. Uh, that's totally amazing. I thought two years ago when I started my project, I, I never thought this was possible. But anyway, it's going on. This is kids working on the robot. We, I uh, also added uh, finger sensors, very cheap things on the, on the fingers. So like this, you can uh, touch things and grab things. Okay, on the next uh, level, there's uh, universities that are working also for um, uh, the relation between the robot and, uh, and the humans. So they have set up cameras. They don't actually uh, really are interested in what the robot can do, but mostly for what the human is reacting to when he sees the robot. There, that's an example. I thought it was a little bit strange to print a red robot for to do this because I think it's a bit scary right away, but you can choose that. Why not? And so they work on this kind of things. We are also have, um, my, with the guys of my robot lab, what we are trying to do is set up a data center. That means um, when uh, the robot sees a ball with the camera, he sees the ball, you tell him it's a ball, he, um, he gets that into the memory with the picture and colors, and then once another robot in move somewhere on another country sees the ball, he's going to be able to say, it's a ball, it's green. It's not working yet. It's one of the projects, and we really are working on it. Uh, the creating base of an artificial is mainly to, um, to get him to respond to what you're saying. At the moment, he, uh, the robot is able to talk, uh, respond, but with commands. That means that uh, the, it's pre-programmed, even though he's able to calculate things, like he's able to calculate how many fingers he's got, or you can tell him uh, uh, 3 plus 2 equal what, and he's going to give you the answer. That's the kind of things he's able to do. But um, it's creating the artificial intelligence is going to be for the interaction. Like uh, you ask him a question, what weather is it? He's going to be able to tell you uh, what is the weather, and what's your name, where you're coming from, who you are with your face, recognize you with a face. So that's the thing. So he can uh, see people, do face tracking. He has the Kinect, so when you do a gesture on the front of him, he can reproduce your gestures. So you can, from those gestures, you can um, capture the gestures to implement them into the robot. So like this, he's going to be able to reproduce those movements. Um, and then at this stage, that's where I am. And I'm trying to find a way to make it uh, viable. Because open hardware, especially at this size, it's huge. So you cannot just print a robot in five minutes and sell it to people that need it. So you have to find, I have to find solutions. I don't know yet how I'm going to do this to be able to, um, to make it uh, go into, uh, into the world so the people can still uh, use the robot, download it, or buy kits, and um, make the project viable, because at this stage, Everything that you see there, all of it, it's my money. I'm not uh, paid by anything from the government or anything. It's just my personal money that is invested into this. And I have a day job. And I cannot do this every day. So I'm working at night. And I'm wondering how open hardware can live today. How, with this system, the economical system we have now, that is ma mainly based on money, how? How is it going to be? How, how, how to survive? That's one of the questions, and I still don't have the answer. I hope, and coming here, I hope I would get some, some advice and maybe some help from people. So in the meantime, for to, uh, to uh, make the people uh, be able to uh, work on the robot, I'm trying to find a way to calibrate the robot to make it 
so everybody can uh, reproduce as easily and that they are all doing the same movements when you ask them to start. Let's say with the arms, when he starts, that my robot is starting like this, but another one's robot is not going to start with the arms up. So uh, the making some uh, small hardware projects, like the shield that I showed you just before, this shield is one of the one of the things that we are working on. You can plug everything, and once you start, you say the robot has to be there, and the cables are all the same on all the robots. That's the kind of things that we're working. Working also on um, a kit for schools and universities. This is not 3D printed anymore, it's uh, injected. So we are trying to gather some money for injection parts to, uh, to be able to produce th those hands. We are searching and seeing how we can do that. One, uh, this, is, this is in the university in the UK with relation between robot and human. Well, that's about, well, that's about it. Yeah, that's it. So if you ask questions, don't ask them not too difficult stuff, because I'm not into robotics somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? Oh, you probably... <laughs> Hi, so that was a very good talk. Um, very confident Thank and, you. and very articulate. I really enjoyed it. Are you afraid of the machine apocalypse? Uh, actually, if I do this, it's because I have hope. And I think uh, I'm seeing the, the, this in another point of view. It, robots are coming. There's no doubt about this. And I think uh, implementing robots at home, because this can be built by a father with his kids, is I think we can learn from it and, and we, we, we should be able to live with it. Not just wait for big companies to bring the robots and say, this robot is going to do this and control you. So um, the hope that I have um, is from this, we can learn how to modify ourselves for to work with robots, and by this means uh, the intelligence, because I think artificial intelligence at one point might uh, go over over us, be stronger than us, and if we if that intelligent intelligence is strong enough, uh, actually the human shouldn't be on Earth. Do you right. see? So if we don't want that, we have to. Uh, adapt ourselves and be, um, be ready and, and uh, live with earth, live with one another and change ourselves. Otherwise, of course, we're going to be wiped out. And, and Sorry, but human survive and I think uh, we will. This is exactly Taylor Swift's point, right? On Twitter, she says that we're building databases of people and then we're telling them why they shouldn't be alive, and then we're building machines, and they're going to know how to kill. And then when you put the two databases together, you put Facebook and all your pictures and all your facial recognition, your DNA sequence together, and then you start building robots like this, it's not a much of a hop, skip, and a jump before these robots start self-funding with Bitcoin and start funding their agendas with weapons and start killing everyone. Yeah. So, but you're optimistic, and that's very, that's very good. But then I this, think we better be. Yeah, and this has to get out yeah. to as many people as possible, and yeah. it needs to be as democratic as possible now. Very good, very good work. Thank you very much. Just a not, not difficult question, <laughs> just that uh, <clears throat> I was very surprised when I discovered uh, at uh, which point it was so democratic for anybody to try to build this uh, in move with friends or colleagues uh, to do something. So could you, um, I'm in not a robotician, but I'm interested in uh, amateur robotics. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was dreaming on YouTube before in move, looking at uh, human-sized robots mm -hmm. of DARPA, Honda, and so on, 
I thought to myself, oh, I hope one day I will see one of these things in France because it costs perhaps one million dollars or half a million dollars. Mm. So please you just say to the people here, oh, it does cost to build uh, an in move with all the, all the motors and pieces and uh, electronic shields, open source. And um, what is uh, the, the size of the 3D printer needed to, to begin your own in move, please? All right. So um, I design all the 3D printed parts to fit on any little home printer. That's also one of the key. You don't need to go to a professional for to to reproduce this robot. You buy a little 3D printer, 700 euros, 1,000 euros, and you can print the parts. I design them in a way that they fit a 12 centimeter cube size. Each part, it's really like a Lego. And so like this, you really, you just pop the part onto your 3D printer and it prints the thing and then you assemble it together, depending the quality of your, your 3D printer. Now the total price of the robot, if you build this according to what I do, uh, not making extra things or stuff like this, you come up to $1,000 or $1,500 depending where you buy the servos. Uh, like I said, these servos are RC servos. The most expensive one are 30 euros. So you've got 22 of these, and then you've got uh, 22, no, 28 uh, servos in total. Um, in each arm, you have uh, six servos. So those servos are between 10, 12 and uh, 15 euros. So it's a very low price robot. <clears throat> the Arduino are 20 euros. The Kinec is. 55 to 90 euros, where depending where you buy it. The cameras, I use, the cameras for the eyes that I use are simple webcams for eight euros. Everything, you know, I, I it's my budget, so I'm not going to put a uh, <laughs> hundred thousand euros in there. <laughs> no way. Thank you. <laughs>